Hello, welcome to Sunday Science Q&A. Uh, we had some lovely background noise. We had a, a, an argument in a hotel room, which added a lot of delight, but I'm afraid you missed that because Trent cut it out uh, for <laughs> taste and decency reasons. Um, anyway, welcome to, uh, it's nice to be back. Uh, just to mention, by the way, I think some of you might have seen last Last week, uh, one of the podcasts went up, which was uh, from Latitude uh, last week because we weren't able to do uh, an episode. And this week as well, two more of the podcasts have gone up uh, from that were all recorded at the Latitude Festival uh, two weeks ago. So go on to uh, Cosmic Shambles and you'll find the latest episodes. Uh, also mention if you can support us via Patreon, that's fantastic. That's how we're able to do these things. And uh, hopefully, I mean, we're hoping in the autumn things are going to kind of kick back off. Obviously, uh, Brian Cox and I were meant to be on a UK tour, uh, but that has been postponed until next autumn, though we are still doing the uh, small warm-up dates in September. Uh, so yeah, if you can support us via Patreon, that helps us keep going. We've got loads of new things coming up. Uh, currently, in fact, the, the latest episode, the beginning of Series four of Tips for Existence is with Rusty Schweikart, and hopefully many of you are rare, aware of Rusty. Rusty was uh, an Apollo 9 astronaut and since then has gone on to do many exciting and interesting things, including in the world of politics, including in the world of uh, working out how we protect ourselves against asteroid strikes. And he's one of the most interesting to me, Apollo astronauts, from his, his philosophical take on what it is to go into, uh, well, leave your home planet and, get, and go further into space and if you get a chance this book here this is an old book called earth's answer and uh it was it has rusty's speech that he did at the lindisfarne convention in 1974 which we talk about uh a bit on tips for existence which was his moment 
of five years after being in space, suddenly everything came together. All of the ideas that had been gestating when he had been looking back on the planet Earth as he floated in space. And he was one of the lucky astronauts that actually got free time due to a camera jam. Uh, suddenly he had just a couple of minutes where he didn't have to do anything. He could just look back on the Earth. And uh, so, yeah, Rusty Schweikart from Apollo 9 uh, is this week's Tips for Existence. And you'll be able to get that if you support us for our Patreon. And also on this series, uh, talking of uh, looking at things from space, we'll have Carolyn Porco on as well, who many of you will know for her work on Cassini and Voyager, the pale blue dot picture, etc. Um, what else do I need to tell you? Current book sham was Rachel England talking about her book, Everyday uh, activism uh, and uh, if you want to ask questions you can just go to the live chat uh, or you can tweet questions to us uh, and uh, today we're going to be talking predominantly it's going to be about different ideas of uh, physics so Helen will be happy now because the last couple that we've done were far too heavily biological for her liking so we're now back to uh, how you'll be able to observe the universe sometimes within your own teacup and sometimes you might have to use a telescope as well but uh, uh, you can just do that so we're joined by Dr Clark Ellist and John Butterworth and Helen first of all have you oh by the way I'll also mention another thing my book tour is all up and running now uh, it starts officially on the 7th of October uh, I'm going to be at our local book it's called our bookshop in Tring so that's the day it gets I'll be doing a talk there uh, in Tring and then I'm off to uh, Manchester St Helens uh, Glasgow Linlithgow uh, Ilkley uh, Carlisle and Settle. That's in the first weekend anyway. So I've got 100 bookshops to go to. So go to cosmicshambles.com and look up the 100 bookshops uh, thing and you'll see the first 50 or so dates of that tour. Helen, what about your uh, week in science? What have you? Uh, well, I've got a suggestion for you first, which is that you um, get uh, our friends from um, the. Uh, Oh, I've forgotten. But you should get Tom. Tom, I have just my brain has just gone completely blank. No good at all. Uh, Helen Arney to record the uh, the, you know, the Tom Lira Elements song. Elements you should song, get yeah. her to do the, your 100 bookshops to the uh, song of the elements. Because I was going to say, why haven't you done them in alphabetical order? But obviously that'd be far too easy uh, to sing. But I'm sure you could get her to sing them for you. So, um, Are you saying that I should have done? So already I'm attempting to do 100 bookshops in about 50 shops in about 50 days across the entirety of the UK. And you're saying I should have actually visited them in an alphabetical order as well. I'm already doing Scotland, Wales, the southwest and the southeast, uh, the southeast in about the first five days. I just think alphabetical you order. Helen to sing. As you long remember. as it's just for the song. Okay. <laughs> um, so just to prove I am not completely uh, dismissive of anything outside physics, my This Week in Science is a biological one, an, ana an anatomical one, uh, because it was this week in 1858 that the first copy of Gray's Anatomy was published. And uh, this is not just a book that pops up because of a US uh, hospital drama, which I have never watched, so I know nothing about it. Um, it was an original medical textbook and Henry Gray was quite an interesting character. He uh, fibbed about his age to get into medical school at the age of 15. He was completely obsessed with bodies and anatomy right from the start. Uh, and he was winning prizes in surgery at the age of 21. And it, he got to the age of 31 and then, well, just a bit earlier than that, uh, and said, well, said to a friend, well, well there's no textbook. This was, a, this, this was at a period where it's still very difficult i mean they were they were then allowed to get hold of bodies for dissection you know people who body bodies which were unclaimed from poor houses and things um but you know he was like well we should have a textbook then we could give our students a textbook and that would help them with the anatomy so he set out on this 18 month project with an illustrator who he never properly credited gray's anatomy was published when he was um 31 um and uh, as a medical textbook for students with all these illustrations. So the first first version of it had 750 pages and 360 illustrations. It set out everything everybody knew about the human body. Um, but Gray himself, although he got to revise it once, he then a few a couple of years later got smallpox and died at the age of 34. All his remaining papers were burnt because that's what happened when you had smallpox. Everything might be contaminated. Um, and so he only saw its first couple of years. And of course, this book went on to be published and republished and has been the sort of Bible for doctors ever since. It's currently on its 42nd edition, which was published last year, and it's now got online versions. Um, but it's just a really interesting thing because it just grew. It was there 
they they kind of did a chunk of work at the start. And then what happened was that every edition that was republished, they updated the medical knowledge and they added to it and added to it and added to it. So the book got bigger and bigger and bigger for a bit. And then they kind of went, OK, now we know too much. Now we have to kind of just turn it into a textbook. Um, but, and his uh, the other thing that is worth knowing, which is quite a common thing, I think, is that his the illustrator of the book, because obviously this is a very famous anatomy book. It's all about the pictures. Um, he didn't want to give the illustrator credit. He crossed the illustrator's name off the original title page for the book. Like he was like, oh, we don't need to give him. We don't need to mention him. He's just sort of somewhere else. Um, and the illustrator got so pissed off. He went off to India uh, and stayed there for 30 years. And, and didn't come back until after that, um, by which time he was added back into the book. So, yeah, so Grey's Anatomy, which has been quoted by everything from everybody from Mark Twain to Star Trek, started 163 years ago um, in the August of uh, 1858. So that's this week's month in week in science. And also, we should say we should say it's it's very cheap to get hold of as well because it's out of copyright and all that. You can get a quite nice copy of it, and it's very interesting. If you haven't got time for that, you can watch the Peter Cushing film, The Flesh and the Fiends, uh, which is uh, an excellent take on uh, how anatomy was studied Ew. in uh, Edinburgh. It's really Ew. good. It's, it's 1960. It's all right. It's a uh, fair enough. Actually, the continental cut is a little bit racy, so I will warn you about that. Um, I think now we'd love because Helen was mentioning before we went on air that uh, uh, she's just found all of her teenage diaries. So I think next week you should go through them and whatever the date is next week, what will it be? Something like the uh, what's it, the 14th or whatever of of, uh, of oh. August. Uh, I think we should find out what it's find the most scientific one or the most mathematical. The first one entry I've only I've only read the and it does have physics and badminton and an environment group I was running in it. So I feel that all of, all of me was present right from the start. But and, was, and they will have all been working together. You'll have been playing yeah. badminton, have been playing yeah. badminton in somewhere of environmental interest, won't you? And the shuttlecock, you will have been constantly mapping out the different trajectory, etc., and and the arc of the shuttlecock. I would imagine as well. Well, to be continued. I will look for what I was doing in August of when I was 16. And yes, let you know. Brilliant. Thank you. I just want to check, by the way, Trent, I can hear all of you in your chair. Does that mean that everyone else can or is it just a special treat for me? There we go. Uh, thank you, Trent. There we go. Just in case you heard someone going, oh, this chair. That was Trent. Um, Dr. Clara Nellis, it's lovely to have you back. A particle uh, physicist uh, working on the Atlas experiment at CERN. And uh, you, I know, have uh, a show. Did you, by the way, write Teenage Diaries? Uh, I wrote some, yeah, and then didn't keep up with it very well, so abandoned that. Do you still have them anywhere, or have you destroyed them for uh, the purposes of your own uh, sanity and the uh, the future? <laughs> I destroyed most of them just because they weren't particularly interesting, but had a lot of gossip at the time, and uh, <laughs> didn't know if I wanted those kept forever. Oh, it's a pity because yeah. Tracy thought. Yeah. Tracy Thorne's book, uh, which I, which uh, another place which I highly recommend to people, is a fantastic book of her teenage diaries where she goes, I don't understand. I know what I actually did on this day, and it was amazing. And all I wrote down was, went to Brent Cross Shopping Centre, tried to find a scarf, couldn't find any. Rubbish. And that's it. And she said, actually, here's all the things I did that day. But all I used to write about was disappointing shopping trips. Um, so what is your show and tell? For I have... Well, I'm quite excited about this show and tell. So I asked the CERN museum people if I could borrow something for today. And so it looks just like an ordinary pipe, but this is actually a prototype of the LHC beam pipe. So I have also got... Does that... I did practice this bit. Can you see... <laughs> Okay, well, just about, yeah, no, 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 you nearly got it there. Just uh, did I get it? Angle. Yeah, do, do, do that again. You just. It's actually the light coming from behind. The, yeah. The, through the, the white hole. When, when it lines up with the wall, we can see the white reflect, the light yeah. reflect off the wall. I'll tell you what I need to do is, oh, I don't know if I can make so my video like video. little holes in there. What? It looks like yeah. rows of holes. So um, there's an incredible amount of physics just in this pipe and I think sort of years of research that went into this. So I'm going to start actually on the outside. Um, so the, the well, both sections, so there's two pipes that you can see. They're both made out of stainless steel. So stainless steel is um, a very strong material. So we need the rigidity to keep the vacuum. So inside here is where the protons go. Um, and we have a vacuum inside the beam pipe. Um, so we need the rigidity to keep the strength of the beam pipe and um, 
Also, in case the magnets quench, which is uh, if they're because they're super fluid, no, because they're super conducting. Um, if they go too high a temperature, then it could be the. Um, so let me start that again. So the um, <laughs> the super conducting it means there's no resistance in the coil of the magnet, and so this means that the um, there's no resistance, and so we can get a really high uh, magnetic field for the dipole magnets. And if the temperature is too high, then we get a resistance in the wire, and we no longer have this um, this uh, no resistance. So we have to the the beam pipe is surrounded by the coils of the dipole magnet, and then the whole thing is put in a uh, bath of superfluid helium. Uh, so the superfluid helium cools the whole thing down to 1.9 degrees Kelvin. So the other reason that it is uh, stainless steel is then because uh, we don't want the material to interfere with the um, with the magnetic field lines of the, the dipole magnets. So then we have the inside of the beam pipe. So this is called the beam screen, uh, and the beam screen is also stainless steel, but uh, this is one I wanted to show. Can I make my screen bigger in this? We're going to find out. This is what this whole show is about. It's about experimentation. It's about science. This is what we're going to find out. Yeah, so I wanted to be able to see my screen because I wanted to see if you can really see inside. So the inside. Oh, it. Yeah, you, yeah, you we just there. there. Yeah. yeah. Um, I would move the beat, move the pipe to your. There's something very beautiful about showing a tool that is yeah. for such incredible exact nature yeah. of of, yeah. of of studying the universe and then just getting a great big torch you'd use in a power cut and going, hopefully I'm going to hit this. Because I think now people are going, is that how it actually works with the Atlas experiment? Yeah, yeah, we kind of just... <laughs> yeah. You can see a yeah. smooth wall with, with four ro rows of, of holes. Yeah, so I'm very excited about this this uh, tube, so that's why I'm getting so over enthusiastic. So the inside pipe is called the beam screen. So the two tubes are separated. There's actually a gap between them. So um, the stainless steel on the outside is uh, the bit that uh, keeps the vacuum in and you have the dipole magnet on the outside and the dipole magnet, as I was saying, has to be kept really, really cold, 1.9 Kelvin. So the inside pipe, this is called the beam screen. And I think you could maybe see there's a layer of copper on the inside. Mm. So the beam screen is actually, um, its main job is when the charged protons, as they travel around the LHC, the dipole magnet changes their direction and uh, the protons give us off synchrotron radiation. And the synchrotron radiation hits the inside of the beam screen and causes heat on the, on the pipe. So we don't want that heat to uh, interact with the dipole magnet. We don't want it to uh, cause the dipole to heat up. So that's one of the main jobs of the beam screen. The other job is the copper uh, on the inside is because the protons will travel through the beam pipe at a very high energy and they induce a charge on the inside of the pipe as they travel through. And so we want something that is electrically uh, conductive, which copper is, so that there's no, uh, or it reduces the amount of heat that is caused by the um, charges forming on the inside of the pipe. Uh, we also have these uh, little tubes that are connected to the beam screen and these are there to help carry some of the heat away from the inside of the pipe. Uh, and then Helen was asking about these uh, small holes that are in the, the beam screen. And so these holes are because, um, so first of all we want to make sure there's a gap between the uh, beam pipe and the, or there's there's gaps between the beam pipe and the beam screen to allow gas to pass through because as I was saying, the inside is a vacuum. Um, but what we have to be really careful of is when the protons travel through the LHC, they have their own electric field as they're traveling through. Um, and if they hit these bumps, it's you can think of it like when you push someone on a swing, it's an interaction with that electric field. And so if, what you can't really see, but these all of these little bumps are randomly uh, placed along the beam pipe. And the reason that they're randomly placed is that if, when you push someone on a swing, if you push someone regularly, 
they gain energy and swing higher and higher. And we don't want that to happen with the with the bunches of protons because it could cause uh, instabilities in the beam and then it will um, it might hit the beam pipe and that would be very bad. So these are randomly placed around the LHC pipe along both sides so that it's the same as pushing somebody randomly on a swing and you get a, a bit of a wobble but you don't get this resonance of um, of the protons. Um, there's one more thing I wanted to say about this. Well, so the main thing is that there's two of these beam pipes side by side because the protons go uh, in one direction through one pipe and the other direction in the other pipe. And so then they're surrounded by the dipole magnet and super cooled. Oh, and so the, the thing I wanted to show you was it's shorter in the vertical distance. So this is the way around it would be in the LHC and it's slightly wider on the horizontal distance. And this is because protons with higher momentum in the LHC uh, actually travel in a higher orbit, a wider orbit in the LHC and protons with lower momentum have a smaller orbit. So there is a horizontal dispersion of the beam uh, as it's traveling through. And we do have quadrupole magnets that focus the beam, um, but because there's a, a wider dispersion here, we have to have a wider beam pipe. And so this is called, uh, many photographers might recognize the word, this is the aperture of the beam. So this is the space that the beam has to travel through. So I think I got everything uh, about the beam pipe. Did you say this is a prototype? Is this a new, and against is this a new, and against is this a new version? Or a new version? So this is an early prototype. This is an early one of the designs so that's it was now one of the in the, designs um, it's now in the um, museum. Well, not right now, because I borrowed it. And then there also, there's going to be a new museum at CERN being built right at the entrance. And so they're working on all the exhibits that they're going to be able to show people coming to visit CERN to learn about how how the accelerator and the particle physics works. Physics works. That's brilliant. Just a kind of a circular museum where half of the people go around in one direction, the other half go around in the other <laughs> direction, and eventually they collide. Uh, that's why I don't design museums. Yet again, the National Trust never in go with very any of my stuff. stuff. Now we're very mm -hmm. excited to have someone else who worked at CERN. In fact, he was in charge of buying the batteries for any of the torches that they use. So uh, very relevant to what we've just seen. Uh, we're joined by John Butterworth. Um, hello, John. And we will warn the uh, the audience at home as well that John was at a big birthday party last night and is feeling a little bit dowdy in the head. Um, mm. So that's fair enough, isn't it? Three breakfasts, John, this morning. Right, that's right. Although I hope not to present the evidence at any point in th that I've actually had them. But yes, um, that's right. The, the, I really, really good to see that beam. One of the stories I like about the beam pipe, right, is that, um, that Clara will certainly know as well, is um, when they built the, the tunnel that the Large Hadron Collider is in, which is like 27 kilometres round, there was a big argument about what should the bore of the tunnel be? How big should it be? Should it be like the Northern Line or the Circle Line or that kind of thing? And the argument was, well, we, they put an electron collider, the electron positron collider in first, and you didn't need such a wide tunnel for that. And then they said, but later we'll want to do a proton one, so you've got to build it bigger. And they add, a, and it, of course, it costs a lot more money if you're going to build it bigger, if you're going to build the, the tunnel bigger. So they compromised. They said, we'll build it a bit bigger than we need for the electron positron machine, but not big enough to put a proton proton collider in, unless you do something really clever with the beam design. So that with the technology they had at the time, you couldn't have built the LHC. But it said, go and do it. So when Clara talks about the dipoles and these figure eight dipoles with one beam going through one of the holes in the eight and the other beam coming the other way through the other hole in the eight, they didn't know they could do that at the time. They said, we can probably do that, but we'll do it. So they said, go and do the R&D. And if you can do that, the tunnel will be big enough to fit the LHC in. But if you can't do it, then we won't be able to build the LHC. And they went off and did it. So they compromised. They spent more money than they needed for the E plus C minus machine, but not as much as they thought they needed for the LHC. And then they did the R&D to build the beam pipe Clara just showed you with the dipole that the, the two beam pipes fit in. So I had no idea that the funding of massive scientific uh, equipment like that came along with a dose of you have to do your, you're supposed to eat your main, you've got to do your homework before you can have pudding. It's always like that. It's always like, look, we, before we invest in this infrastructure, we're never going to build something we know how to build. You never get funding for something you already know how to build because it's like, oh, that's boring then. Go and do more work. We'll, we'll give you the money, but build something better and do the R&D. Because, you know, the point is the R&D at some level as well, right? So, Which is research and development for those people who are not... Um, uh, Full of, right. full of acronyms. <laughs> right, thanks for reminding me. I'm, I am a bit sluggish this morning, so I've probably forgotten what it stood for myself. But yes, that's right. 
Yes, anyway, so thank you for showing the beam, Clara. I hope I'm making sense. Am I making sense? Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely yeah. fine. Yeah, you're absolutely yeah. fine. And if you're not making sense, we'll just count it as a beat poem. So don't worry, because Cosmic Shambles does art and science. So right. one way or other, you'll fit in. It'll be fine. I, I wanted to ask you, Brett, since we've been off air, uh, the, uh, the, the, the the celebrated Nobel Prize winning um, scientist Stephen Weinberg has, has died. And also some many people will know his work also from Dreams of a Final Theory, which was a, a, a tremendously successful book. And uh, I know you know quite a lot about his, his work, John. So I just wanted to, to ask you what, what is it about Stephen? I mean, you before we went on air, you said so much of the work that you've done comes off the back of Stephen Weinberg's research, comes off the back of his. So, so can you give us the audience a little bit of a sense of, of what? Sure. I, it's actually astonishing. I went back because I knew I was doing this. I went back and reread his paper and it's 50 years ago, right? Actually, his paper came out the year I was born and it's three pages long, maybe three and a half, um, a bit equation heavy. Um, so I wouldn't recommend your audience go and necessarily go and read it. But the astonishing thing is, this is 50 years old, 1967 this paper came out, um, so 55 nearly now. And, uh, oh God, I'm old, aren't I? Um, and sorry, that's... <laughs> That's the kind of thing that happens when you've had three breakfasts and a lot of drinks is you're very good at explaining physics still, but every month now and again, existential anxiety kicks in as well. That's it's very natural. Occupational hazard, I'm afraid. <laughs> um, the, the, so I actually went to a meet. The only time I met Stephen Weinberg actually was at a meeting to celebrate 50 years of the standard model, uh, which actually did coincide with my 50th birthday. And, and this paper was up there the same age as me. I think I am the same age as the standard model because uh, while the standard model of, with the standard model, right, is is the collection of theories, the quantum field theories that we use to describe three of the four fundamental forces and all the known matter particles. Um, and it's hard to put a finger on your finger on. No, there were many contributions to it, but probably the consensus would be Stephen Weinberg's paper on the model of leptons is probably the best average. You know, the consensus start of the standard model, and it's three pages long. It's full of equations. It's that old. But the equations are Clara would, and, you know, if you go to CERN, you buy one of them mugs with, with the, the theory. It's those equations. The, the language has not changed, right? The, the way we describe physics, oft, I've read lots of old papers, some of them not as old even as Stephen Weinberg's. And the ideas have evolved so much since then that it's really hard to work out what they were on about. Not with Weinberg's paper. It's like, no, here it is. This is the standard model. This is the weak force. This is the electromagnetic force. This is how to mix up. This is electric unification. Uh, we probably need the Higgs mechanism to make this work. And Peter Higgs wrote this down four years ago. So here it is. Uh, this is probably renormalizable, but I'll leave that for future work. And Gerard Tuft and Tini Veltman did that a few years later. Uh, but it's just, this is the pivot point. This is where it all comes together. Two of the fundamental forces are unified. The language in which we write all three of them down is defined. It's just amazing. And and to go and read it now, it's as fresh as it was 50 years ago, 55 years ago. It's 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 it really, as I was saying, as you said before, it's it's it set the paradigm. I hate the word paradigm, but my God, this is a paradigm. This is quantum field theory, as you no, know, born that day at some level, and and it's and it's still in place. And it, it specifies how the the weak and the electromagnetic force, so the photon and then the W and the Z boson, how they mix up, how they're defined in terms of fundamental symmetries, how then you introduce a particle that has a vacuum expectation value, which is pulling Peter Higgs's stuff out of the, the cupboard to do that, and uh, and how that can give mass to all the fermions. And he said, this does it for the electron. The muon is quite new, and I'm not sure the muon's that important, but it'll probably work for the muon too, and they all have what we call a Yukawa coupling that's bigger. Didn't even use the words, but it's all there. You can see it. And and they didn't even know about the tau lap. So we haven't even got all the particles of the standard model. And yet here it is. This is the jigsaw they all fit into. It's just amazing. That's Stephen Weinberg. Yeah, sorry. Also, the first three minutes, you mentioned dreams of a final theory. The first three minutes was the book I read before I went to do university interviews for physics. And I I taught I bored all my interviewers with the first three minutes by Stephen Weinberg, but it's it's an amazing book too. Fantastic, thank you, John. And and uh, Clara, what, would, would you, you like, like to add? Anything anything about would you like to add anything about Stephen? I mean, it, I think I mean it, John's really uh, summed it up uh, very well. I mean, Stephen Weinberg, his work uh, is shun of so much of the work we do at CERN. I mean, the standard model is really what we are testing at the LHC. Uh, and as a young student, reading the so I read um, a model of leptons as a student. And just to to think that you could have so much physics, as John was explaining, in just such a short paper. And also, so the the, the 
equations are a little bit tough if you don't have the mathematics, but the language is is very friendly. It's just such a nice paper to read and just you almost see the ideas evolve as the paper goes on, almost as though he's thinking of them as he's writing it down. It's um, good. Yeah. Good. Well, exactly the language of what you said there. That that's really impressive, right? So about half the paper, right, is equations, or maybe a third of it is equations. But if you if you were to read this paper and just take on faith the equation, the, ignore the equations, you know, skip over them and say, right, I'll believe what you say. As Clara says, it it's so clear. It's not. There's no pretension. There's no building himself up. It's like it, it's like here's what the, this might work. This and it's beautiful English and so unpretentious. And, and, you know, the equations are really tough. I mean, for Clara and I, they're familiar, but they're not, they'll be impossible to understand. But but the words are just not, it's just so beautiful and clear. Yeah, it's, it's, I, you're right, Clara, it reminded me how you see the man thinking, you know, and, and, and the clarity of thought is just... Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you. And in fact, I mean, people watching this go online as well. There's, he wrote many articles and and certainly in later life, very often kind of active in terms of uh, debunking some, you know, some of the pseudo scientific ideas out there and the importance of evidence based thinking and, and a very witty writer uh, as, as, as well. Um, now, we better get on with some questions because we're halfway through the show because we're halfway through the show. Um, so this is one of the things is also I realize how many questions when it's physics, this can take a while. Each question, as we know, I'm going to start off with Lily's question. Uh, Lily says, um, I hope you might be able to help me get my head around something, but I doubt it. If a field or a force can give something mass, does that make it matter? If not, how can a force, which isn't a physical thing, have mass if it is effectively nothing? Now, Clara, can I start with you on that? I mean, this is all to do with the Higgs field and how the, the Higgs field um, gives mass to fundamental particles. And my favourite way to explain this, which I think comes from John Ellis at CERN, who is a, a theorist at CERN, um, is to talk about um, a snow field. Uh, so you have um, a field of snow and you have somebody uh, skiing on top of the of the snow. And because they're on skis, they're basically on top and they're not interacting with the snow very much. And so they don't have very much mass. If you don't interact with the field, you don't have mass. But then there's somebody coming along in snowshoes and they're able to get through the snow field, but it's slowing them down. It is making it more difficult for them to, uh, to travel through the snow field. And so that is the interaction with the field giving that particle mass. And then somebody comes along with no snowshoes, just some heavy boots, and they sink right into the snow. And through their efforts to really get through the snow field, then they gain a lot of mass. And this is a really heavy particle like the top quark. And so it's not that the snow is mass itself, but it's slowing down the particles. And that's how the mass then uh, is given to the particles. And then you have the interaction of the field with itself. So if the snow interacts with itself, you get a massive snowball. And this is the Higgs particle. So this is how the interaction of the field with itself can create uh, the Higgs boson. That's brilliant. Thank you very much. And uh, very much. And uh, I wish uh, you at home could have seen the relief on John's face when I went to Clara first. Um, now, this is always an interesting one. This is Dean would like to know, how is the universe more than 27.6 billion light years across if it's only 13.8 billion years old? And what we find out is the universe is a cheat, I believe, that does not follow its own laws. John. <laughs> I think, can I do the mass one instead? Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, well, first of all, right, it's it's expanding in all directions. So it can be twice as big in light years, even if it's traveling at the speed of light, it can be twice as big in light years as the age of the universe. So that's one one part of the answer. But yeah, it, it, I, I, I think it's true that we uh, the, the cosmological models hypothesize actually the universe is much, much bigger than the the horizon that we can see um because the current um current cosmological standard model which by the way is on nowhere near as firm ground as the particle physics one but it's the best we have at the moment um hypothesizes that there's a period of inflation so the the um the fact that the universe is homogeneous and what by i mean it's flat it all looks pretty much the same if you if you pan back far enough um the implies that um so it's a bit odd, right, that 
the universe by its own laws cannot have been in contact with the bit, the bits of the universe that were starting to be revealed now as as the as we see light from however 13 billion point eight billion years ago the universe cannot have been in co been causally connected across that period because it couldn't have exchanged information according to general relativity so how can that be that it looks like it was it looks like it's all kind of in equilibrium it looks like at some point it thermalized it it kind of all was in contact and the way you get around that is this idea of inflation so yes it, exactly as you implied at the beginning there was a period particularly where the universe expanded much faster than the speed of light and that's why it looks sort of flat geometrically and, and uniform uh, because really what we're looking at is is um that whatever shape the universe has is kind of averaged out because we're only really looking at a tiny bit of it probably because the rest of it has inflated to some enormous size um yeah so that's the way god I, I, yeah the, the hangover's telling now but that, that's well that's, i think it's just occurred to me that um so it's a while since i read the first three minutes stephen weinberg's book but i'm pretty sure and obviously that's going back was it the early 90s when that was published but that's one of the things he discusses in that book so two yeah. reasons to read that book this week that's right no that's right exactly and the three minutes is a heck of a long time everything we're talking about here is in the first few nanoseconds i think but but the, so weinberg does a lot more about how you know how matter formed and how the stars formed and things as well which is just amazing but you're right that he talks about inflation i think actually the the the, the the favored paradigm for cosmology has actually changed since that book so it used to be that you'd have a big bang and then for some reason a period of inflation and then where we are now now i think most cosmologists tend to talk of it the other way around they talk about there being a period of inflation which might even still be going on somewhere and then the big bang is when the inflation stops and everything dump, all the energy from the inflation dumps into matter so interestingly that there is a change in all of this is models right we don't have a lot of direct evidence this is just the best we can work out from observations but the the, the favored explanation has sort of changed order at some level the big bang now is seen as the end of inflation not the beginning of it if you say I mean anyway but yeah, That's, it's because the universe can go faster than the speed of light. It can grow faster than the speed of light. Fantastic. Fantastic. Thank you, John. And uh, Helen, Steve would like to know, why do polarised sunglasses only polarise light in certain directions? For example, things look completely different when you rotate the lenses 90 degrees. Well, so polarised sunglasses, uh, the, the polarisation of light, you can think of as the direction that it's waving. So it can wave this way or it can wave that way if the beam's coming towards you. And Polarised light, uh, the polarised sunglasses rely on an assumption and the assumption they rely on is that there's two things you need. There's two things that might be um, made clearer if you saw a polarised view and they are the sky and reflections off the water surface. So if you're going over water, um, you quite often get glare, you know, if the sun shines down onto the water and up into your eyes. And that is the sort of thing that you might want to uh, get rid of if you, uh, you know, that's extra, extra light that's not helping you very much, but that can can dazzle you. Right. So you can't see what's going on around it. So basically polarized sunglasses. And, and when it comes to so if you think of light coming down to water and then reflecting off um, the way the angles at which you get different amounts of reflection depend on whether the light is polarized this way or that way. So basically you can have light of, you can imagine light coming in in one of two directions um, and one of them contributes far more to the glare off the water than the other one because of the way that light is reflected off water. So, so basically the way that polarised glasses work is they assume they're removing the dominant problem, but they don't remove all of the problem. But because you're generally looking at water at a really low angle. So if you're looking out over a lake, you know, the, the water's kind of just skimming the surface and just bouncing off and just making it back out to you. So the polarisation, the amount of light that's polarised, um, there's a strong role so it's much more one polarization than the other so if you just remove that polarization you still get to see the rest of the world because you know you still want to see things you don't want to black out everything um but you don't the problem mostly goes away so obviously if you rotate that the other way then what you can see is the problem rather than all the things that aren't the problem um so polarized glasses basically making the assumption that you are standing upright anybody who is trying to sail a boat by hanging off the uh, mast at a weird angle needs different glasses <laughs> brilliant thank you helen hello by the way John's you're got watching something to add. oh go on john <laughs> ask a question because I, I, I want to ask robin a question 
picture of the one who just asked me. So, Robin, if you've got polarized, Polaroid light, so light is either going like that. Oh, I don't do those questions. Right. So if no, you no, have... no, I don't do them. Helen does those. All right. I've got a physics butler as well. Do you not know that? I've, I've a, I have a little man called, called right. Professor Cox, and he does all my physics for me. Look, OK, I'll tell you then. <laughs> If you get one lens of Polaroid sunglasses, you shut out the light going that way. You another lens at right angles to it, you shut out the light going the other way. So it's black, right? You get nothing getting through. What do you think happens if you put one at forty-five degrees in between them? Uh, does it kill the cat? No. <laughs> kind of, yeah. It's quantum mechanics. It's true. So you think it could only it can't, it's dark already. It can't get darker, right? Actually, you start getting light through because what you do is you you you. So if you have light going like that and you shut it out and then your next one shuts all the light going that way that's all the light gone but if in the middle you make you force the light to do this you've had some vertical light you've now made it go at 45 degrees now it has a horizontal component again and it will get through so you get you actually by what you think you might be putting more and more lenses to stop more and more light if you put them at the wrong angle you'll let more light through because you put an extra lens in the way that's quantum mechanics it's very cool sorry so Brilliant. don't wear multiple pairs of Polaroids at very strange angles. I think that's yeah. what we just learned. Yeah, it's very weird. It's, 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 just kind of, it's quantum mechanical mixing. It's the same thing that makes neutrinos change flavour. It's very cool. Cool. See, that's why, that's why I don't wear sunglasses. I only wear a sun monocle, and that allows the other eye to then have the... Uh, um, this is... Uh, now, this question from Stephen, Clara, for you. Oh, by the way, hello, everyone. If you, you just joined us, you're watching Sunday Science Q&A. Uh, we've with uh, Helen Chersky, John Butterworth and Clara Nellis today and uh, we're taking questions on physics and uh, I'll just quickly mention by the way if you don't support us via Patreon already if you would like to or if you can patreon.com slash cosmic shambles we've got a load of uh, episodes of tips for existence going up I mentioned at the beginning Rusty Schweikart from Apollo 9 you can also hear our back catalogue where we've got people like Neil Gaiman and Nicole Stott and Andrean and Brian Green um, and uh, your support goes to us making lots of other shows as well we have a new series of uncanny science stuff as well as also uh, lots of stuff about books and art as well um there is no clash uh, between the two cultures here generally um now uh Stephen has a question yes Clara for you which is uh I saw a tweet recently can't remember by who sorry and it kept mentioning de Broglie I presume this is Louis de Broglie is that that I hope I've got the, the pronunciation uh right who I think is a, is kind of like the the aristocrat of, of quantum mechanics though I might I might be be wrong about this um, but was mentioning de Broglie wavelength, and I wondered if Clara could give me a dummies version of what this means. Can I pass this one back to John? Because yeah, of course I you can. <laughs> Let's say Sorry, John. Are you just doing that because you enjoy seeing John's facial expression each time I mean, that happens? That was a bonus of that. Um, okay. I, yeah, I think John will give a better dummies version, and then I can talk a little bit about how it helps us in particle physics okay. to do the de Broglie wavelengths. So. Um, it's to do with wave particle duality. Um, so it's the fact that you can associate, um, if you think of some particles have momentum, so you think of a particle moving along with momentum, but it's also, you also have to think of it as a wave if you want to get a full description of nature. So this is the early days of developing quantum mechanics. Um, and indeed, de Broglie was some Parisian aristocrat who sort of fell out with Heisenberg and Schrodinger and people um, because he he uh, he had a different picture. But it turns out they're all the, the actually equivalent. Um, so if you have a particle moving along um, with some momentum, which is, we're used to thinking of just its speed times its mass, that has an associated wave wavelength with it in the same way. So you think of um, you can see the waves carry momentum, right? So water waves hitting the Sure, they're, they're, they're impacting, they're rebounding, they're carrying momentum. And the de Broglie wavelength is the equivalent wavelength that would, if you, if you imagine particles bouncing off the seashore and say, well, no, let's think of them as waves now, then the de Broglie wavelength is the equivalent wavelength of that wave. So there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the momentum of a particle and the effective wavelength of that particle. And it's very hard to get an intuitive picture. And in fact, it leads you down the rabbit hole of, of quantum mechanics and, and led... No, it was part of the formative years of quantum mechanics. But now we're very used to thinking of that all the time. That's that's the way we think of particles as having that. You can think of them in terms of momentum or you can think of them in terms of wavelength. You can think of energy and frequency as also being kind of complementary variables. And, and they're both equivalent pictures of the same thing. And it's to do with this wave particle duality. But the answer is that the Broglie wavelength is the equivalent wavelength that if 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 a certain amount of momentum, a particle carrying a certain amount of momentum, if it was carrying it as a wave, it's what would be the wavelength of that wave. 
Oh, and then I was going to add on top of that. Thanks, John. Um, so the the then if we want to probe, for example, inside the proton, so we want to see because the proton isn't um, a fundamental particle. It has uh, particles inside of it, so quarks and gluons. And if we want to look inside something like that, then we need something that has a small enough wavelength to be able to get inside and to be able to probe uh, probe the structure of the proton. So this is how it then uh, affects the work that we're doing. Yeah, it's, just, it's why we need such high energies to see little things because you, the high energy means a short wavelength and that gives you the res the necessary resolution, as Clara says. Right, question we just had in uh, um, from uh, Jonathan who would like to know, will it ever be possible to make a collider that can send a particle at the speed of light or are there limiting factors, Clara? So we can already... Uh, photons at the speed of light. So these are massless particles and they, they can travel at the speed of light. And then as we give them more energy, uh, they're not traveling any faster, but they, they have more energy to do interesting things. Um, but there is a limit for particles with mass that at some point you put more energy in and they're not going any faster. Um, they're just gaining more mass. They have more momentum to be able to, um, well, the, yeah, they have more mass so that then we can do higher energy collisions, um, but they're not actually going any faster. So it's a fundamental limit of the universe that particles with mass cannot travel at the speed of light um, in, in, well, so the interesting thing is some particles with mass can travel faster than the speed of light in a material. And then we get really interesting effects um, called Cherenkov radiation. So this is where, for example, we could have a really high energy um, electron or a muon that travels faster than the speed of light in that stuff, in ice or whatever medium it is. And it gives off a special type of radiation that we can then use to say that that particle was there, but it's not traveling faster than the speed of light in a vacuum, which is the ultimate speed limit of the universe. Brilliant, thank you, Clara. One, Clara, one for you, Helen. Uh, Nicola would like to know, we always hear about dark matter and dark energy and all the big unsolved problems in particle physics, but what are the dark matter level questions in the real world physics that you do? Uh, well, the, the classic answer is turbulence, <laughs> um, because uh, there's, which is the sort of mixing up of fluids where you have uh, fluids kind of moving over each other and generating little worlds at lots of different scales. So, and it, turbulence is everywhere. Um, whenever you have a, you know, anything moving through a fluid just at the surface, there's a, that, the, the, the liquid, let's say it's a liquid above the solid thing, at that surface, it kind of gets dragged along with it. But then you get little, it pushes on the liquid above it and you get these little whirls. And so you get a boundary layer, which can be very thick or very thin. And it makes an enormous difference to how much resistance there is to push something through a fluid. And turbulence is very weird. We have good descriptions of it in um, situations where it's all quite well mixed. So whatever direction you go in, the turbulence looks the same. But it's it's really, there's no, so there are descriptive ways to look at turbulence which are quite useful in fluid dynamics um there's no general model and although we are making a lot of progress it's just quite messy <laughs> so but turbulence matters for a lot of things especially if you're trying to make uh, vehicles more efficient you know ships airp airplanes cars bikes whatever um and to understand where energy goes because fundamentally turbulence is the way turbulence is kind of like the dustbin of energy uh of useful energy in our world because once you once you've got these little worlds they can't push on anything else they're just kind of they get smaller and smaller there's a great little poem that was written that goes something like big worlds push on little worlds oh i'll have to look it up it's brilliant but it, it, but it finishes with viscosity the point is that um all of that energy eventually becomes heat. It basically, the friction, internal friction inside the fluid turns it all into heat. So turbulence is a, is a big deal. But the bigger, the bigger question, the bigger answer is um, complex systems in general. So, so there are lots of systems where the classical forces, you don't need any quantum mechanics or any general relativity to, to look at these systems at all, it, completely classical. Um, so you've got surface tension and viscosity and gravity is pulling on things and you can take Newtonian gravity to do it. Um, but they're all kind of equal. They're all sort of jostling at about the same level of importance. So instead of one of them dominating and then you get that effect, you get this little battle, this constant battle, and it can tip in lots of different directions depending on exactly what the starting conditions are. And 
And that, that leads to complexity in the system where a small, well, there are chaotic systems where a small difference in the starting conditions can lead to large different outcomes. Um, and there are just systems that are complex because that there, there's these trade-offs. It's a huge interlinked system. And so systematic understanding of those is, is the next big challenge. And the thing is that all the way that certainly Clara and John and I were all were taught physics was not only a reductionist approach, which is very powerful, but it was this endless search for elegance. And it was very obvious to me when I moved from um, explosive science into to, um, bubble physics and environmental science that this is holding physics back that the, I was going to conferences and people were desperate to come up with a descriptive model that you could draw a line through. And you could say, here are all the dots on the line and it proves that this model is correct. And it's so obvious that the natural world just doesn't work like that. And But they were they were desperate for elegance. Like, is does it does, is it proportional to the velocity cubed or the velocity squared? Like, it's not, <laughs> right? It's not either of those things. And, and so... In a way, I think the biggest battle is overcoming that search for elegance because of it, there are still some satisfying solutions, but there isn't. Physics was, was traditionally the search for beautiful, simplistic, like as John was describing. You know, this is the you look you look at the jigsaw puzzle this way, everything fits. That is not the way the world of complex systems works, and and actually, so so that search for elegance has held physics back for a long, long time, and and so now. There will be answers, but the problem is they're not going to be pretty. <laughs> but they will be very useful. So that's so those are the, those are that's where the um, the boundaries are. Presumably, that's because, 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 because you're kind of biologists, 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 you know, you're, 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 you're advantages. Advantages. Oh, biologists, biologists just gets, gets messier, messier and more you understand. Whereas we're oh, it's not as elegant as we'd hoped. So I presume that was uh, uh, now, John. I've got another question for you. We've let you have enough rest time now. This should be okay, I think, because it's based on something you've written. Uh, so this is from. <laughs> This is from T. Harper. This is uh, says that in John's last shambles blog. And by the way, he says more, please. Uh, he said that he was waiting on the magnetic moment on the muon. Firstly, did it happen? Secondly, what is it? <laughs> yes, it happened. Um, so there was a, a new measurement. I should. Yeah, I should update that. I didn't realize that was the last time I'd done anything. Yes, it was. It was. Um, it, we, it was measured. So um, and it was measured and the measurement was consistent with the previous measurement and therefore inconsistent with the standard model at some level. Um, although there's still some controversy about exactly how those calculations are done, there's, there is definitely a, a discrepancy there between these two things. Um, so yeah, that happened and they're taking more data and it, they will measure again uh, in, a few, in a year or so, I guess we'll get another, more updates. So they'll be rolling updates of that measurement. And um, if it continues to just shrink the error bars and stay roughly where it was, then there'll be a growing discrepancy with our standard model there. As to what it is, it's the way um, the muon is a particle like the electron. Um, it's, it has a, a negative charge and, and a spin, an angular momentum. And it's the way the muon interacts with a magnetic field. So a, a spinning particle which has a charge has a little magnetic dipole, it has a north and a south pole, effectively. and um, the magnetic moment of the um, electron was kind of the, the, the poster child of, of Feynman's QED, of, of the whole um, development of quantum field theory. It's, it's the most precisely known physical quantity, I think, at all. It's measured something like 11 decimal places. I may even be getting that wrong. Correct me if you know the actual number, Clara. But it's, it's, it tells you how precise it is, though. I don't know how many decimal places it's known, never mind what the numbers actually are. Um, but And it's measured to a similar degree, and they agree, they check out completely. So Dirac said this, that it should be two, and, and, it's, and so that's why it's called G minus two, because it's the difference from two. Um, the, the simple Dirac equation says it's two. You put in the interactions of quantum field theory, you get something that's not quite two, Feynman and uh, Feynman and and um, Tomonaga and Schwinger provided the um, mechanism to calculate that, and it's you know the borderline between atomic physics and particle physics, and they got it's right. The muon you can do the same thing. It's harder to measure because the muons decay, so it's not quite as well known, but it's still very well known. Um, and um, the uh, it's also harder to calculate um, and may involve more beyond the standard model physics just because the muon is heavy but you can heavier but you can calculate it in the standard model and that's where the discrepancy is so it's the strength of this interaction of 
the spinning charge of the muon with a mag an external magnetic field, basically. Brilliant. Thank you very much. We just had a question can, from. Can um, I just very quickly add on to that? It's really interesting as someone still relatively like early on in my career to see the drama of the theorists as this calculation is being updated and the discussions because originally the measurement uh, didn't agree with theory and now there's some uh, additional calculations being discussed about whether they can be added into the theory and there's it's very dramatic and people are talking about it in restaurants and coffees and virtual uh, events at the moment but to watch it unfold and to see the discussion it's very interesting uh, to, to see happen in, in real time. Now we have this a question from Adela, who's nine years old. Hello, uh, you've just sent this question in, and it's an interesting question. Adela would like to know how did Chinese scientists create temperatures six times hotter than the sun without burning the room? Now, who would like to take that one? Let's find out. Helen, are you up to date on this? One? Um, I am not up to date on this. It's a good question because it holds back quite a lot of things. And um, nuclear fusion is one of is indirectly one of these things that the problem is, if you want to make something very hot, you have to not melt the container. Um, so there are ways to confine particles that Clara and John know much more about. So you can confine particles with magnetic fields, for example. Uh, and, and I don't think you do it acoustically, but you can also do it with um, acoustic fields. So there are ways to use things that aren't stuff you can use light and sound to constrain where particles are the problem is that by definition hot things move very quickly so that's quite hard but probably clara and john can add far more to that clara I, oh john um, i i actually not really directly to that but i think there's something behind the question that might be worth clarifying there's a big difference between temperature and heat right so so if you have a is it Adela who asked, asked the yes. question? If you have a, a sparkler, right, the, the spark from a sparkler, the temperature can be comparable to the temperature of the sun, right? It's not, it's really, really hot, but it's such a tiny amount of material that it doesn't even really burn you. I mean, it might sting slightly if it goes on your skin, but it's not going to actually do you any harm. Whereas a, a, a kettle full of boiling water will really hurt you if you if you if it if it goes on your hand. And the difference, even though the, the boiling water is much lower temperature than the spark, but the important thing is the boiling water is is big. It's got a lot more energy in it, a lot more heat. So temperature is about the density of the energy, not about the the amount of energy itself. So if these scientists have a very small amount of material in a room, and uh, Helen mentioned um, fusion, for instance, at so the National Ignition Facility in in, in the U.S. They actually just collide things together, and there's such a small. They, they, the temperature gets really hot. Actually, even at the LHC, you can think of it in terms of temperature when we're colliding heavy, heavy nuclei. It's really, really super hot. It's much hotter than the sun if you if you think of it in terms of temperature. But the amount of material is tiny, so that there's not enough energy there to melt the the beam pipe that you just saw. Um, but but the temperature is really high, so that might be part of the answer as well, right? It, 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 they, it depends on how they did the experiment, though, doesn't it? Because it's if the, the thing that I don't know, having not seen it, is whether they held it at that temperature or whether they generated that temperature for a very short period of time. Because those are two, because if you have a container and you want to hold something at a temperature, then you have to worry about heat getting lost. But if you just want mm -hmm. to smash it. So, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, exactly. I don't know the exact experiment, I'm afraid. So I'm, just, I'm kind of guessing in the dark that part of the answer might be this temperature thing. But Helen's right. If they actually get it to that temperature and control it and keep it that's that's all the problems that Helen's talking about come in there. Yeah. Thank you so much for that question Adela that's a, a, a great question goes off in lots and please do not do practical experiments involving what John said about the sparkler and the kettle either <laughs> do you? Uh, but that was but that great question because you can go to so many different areas as well um, in terms of understanding and then Caleb a uh, question for you Clara Caleb would like to know everyone always seems to talk about protons electrons and hadrons and never of neutrons why are they just not that interesting or is there nothing left to know about them um, um i mean the main reason we use protons at the large hadron collider instead of neutrons is because they're a charged particle and so as i was talking about with the beam pipe and with the dipole magnet that uh directs the protons as they travel around uh the large hadron collider we wouldn't be able to do that with neutrons they would just smash into the side as soon as we got them going because they're not they're not really charged so we can't direct them in the same way. And the same with electrons. We have electrons, uh, uh, well, we had an electron-positron collider, as John was talking about, uh, with LEP, um, that 
they also have to uh, be charged to be able to travel around the the beam pipe. So um, neutrons, uh, they're very useful for things like um, nuclear reactions. So I think we neutrons are used to start uh, a nuclear fusion reaction or a nuclear fission reaction. I'm a bit uh, rusty on that uh, side, but in terms of actually physics and doing particle physics, then we like our particles to be charged so that we can control them better. Brilliant. Thank you. We've got one final question, which involves the possibility of a fight between Helen and John. So before that, just mention thank you very much for, for everyone watching. We'll be back next Sunday, uh, as usual. And there's loads of stuff that will be coming out next week as well. The In fact, I think the next episode of Tips for Existence is with Helen. Uh, and uh, we talked a lot about actually developing the scientific mind when you're a child and kind of ideas of being uh, an intrigued and curious outsider. And and so that, that should be, I think, out next Friday, the next Tips for Existence. And uh, I'll just mention again, my 100 bookshop tour starts uh, in October and I will be Blackwell's in Manchester. I think I'm actually doing the Anthony Burgess Centre with them, which is a fantastic little theatre. Um, and uh, I'll also be up at Mount Florida Books in, in Glasgow and in the bookstop uh, in St. Helens and various others. But just go and look on the Cosmic Shambles site and you'll find all the details of the 100 bookshop tour. Now, the fight. So, uh, Julie says, I saw John's post for Focus yesterday and wanted to ask Helen about something in it. Uh, if the film that covers the sphere shrinks to the exact required size to cover the contained air within, why are bubbles so unstable? Would they stay as bubbles forever without outside air pushing on them? Are we talking about soap bubbles here? John, um, so your post, let's check what you actually wrote. So what have you been doing here? <laughs> Yeah, sorry, I've been moonlighting for the BBC, Robin. I'm sorry about that. Um, they, they, yeah, it was, the question was, why are bubbles round? And I just said, it's a 50-word answer. And it was bubbles in general, but I can use the example of soap bubbles, I think, was what I used. Um, but yeah, I just said that a sphere is a way of, close, of enclosing. It's the smallest surface area that encloses a given volume. And, you know, the, the surface tension forces that shape, basically. So I think you can take it as, yes, soap bubbles. And I guess they fall apart because the the bits that they they lose they evaporate, right? I mean, some of the uh, they fall apart mostly because of gravity, actually. So so they drain. You can actually see, if you look at um, uh, if you have really if you have really good uh, color high speed photography, um, you can see. You know, you get those colors in soap bubbles that reflect the thickness. You can actually see them draining. So so it gets thicker at the bottom and thinner at the top. So in if you put it in an completely undisturbed space and it's not super dry it's normally the draining and it will burst at the top but you're right that if it's a dry environment you get evaporation that speeds it up um, and also if it bumps into a particle in the air you know if there's little bits that sort of poke it that can disturb because the surface if there's if there's air currents it can make it wobble so it can be temporarily thinner it but mm. it's basically the point where the outside touches the inside but in complete if you leave it completely to itself it will usually pop at the top because of if it's lasted long enough to drain uh cool. but yes if it evaporates then that can speed things up as well does that answer the question I what think, the original question i wasn't think it? so i think so there's not been a fight and also she's glad that she didn't actually you Julie sound didn't so want disappointed to no. no scrap 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 <laughs> Um, thank you all very much for joining us. Thank you very much to Clara. And John, by the way, I'll mention John's uh, most recent book. Hopefully you can see it there, Map of the Invisible uh, Journeys. It's because it suddenly reminded me when, because when you were talking about Dirac and you write very beautifully about uh, Dirac in, in this book and some of his worries. And uh, also you start off with St. Bede as well. Uh, or St. Bede is in there quite early on. So St. Bede and Dirac are together. Uh, Helen, I, I was sitting, well, you're, as I said, Tips for Existence next Friday, that, that will be out with Helen. And and uh, also, we'll be back next Sunday with another Sunday Science Q&A. But keep an eye on CosmicShambles.com. We've got loads of things coming up. Have uh, a lovely rest of the weekend. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.